now we're going to talk about law and one of my favorite topics because I'm a former intellectual property and digital technology lawyer. So I've gathered a panel to discuss the very hot button issue sometimes about what role intellectual property should play in the world of blockchain technology. Because many people that are early digital currency and blockchain adopters believe in a world that's perhaps more open source or less reliant on proprietary intellectual property rights but we'll discuss today what value those rights can have in the blockchain ecosystem. So discuss with me, in studio here in New York is Scott Adams, who is a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine, who I mentioned one of our great sponsors for the conference and is a patent lawyer based in Seattle, Washington. Hi, Scott. Hi, Jimmy. And then live from our London studio, two other uh, leading intellectual property lawyers, Carrie Ann Jones, who is a patent attorney and also of counsel now to Enchain. Welcome, Carrie Ann. Hi. And finally, completing the panel is the chief legal officer of Enchain, Will Chelton. Good to see you, Jimmy. So the area I want to begin with is the basic question of understanding intellectual property. Now, there are many different types of intellectual property, patents, copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, but this session is going to focus in particular on patents, since that is sort of the most commonly discussed area in the blockchain world. So I want to sort of demystify and uh, correct any misunderstanding about what patents are. So I'll start with Carrie Ann. Can you describe for our audience what is or is not patentable? And then we'll get into how that applies in the blockchain space. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. So, uh, as you say, Jimmy, there are different types of intellectual property. Um, copyright also applies when we're talking about software-related uh, innovation, but it only protects your source code. It doesn't protect your underlying uh, idea um, and concept behind, lying behind that source code. So if you want to try to protect the, uh, the algorithm, the concept behind your code, then you really need uh, an intellectual property right in the form of a patent because that will give you a 20-year monopoly uh, for uh, that, te that technology. Uh, when it comes to patents, regardless of the type of technology, there are some basic criteria that you have to meet and you have to establish at, at a patent office that your innovation meets these basic criteria. And that is that there is something that's novel and inventive about your innovation. And, and that sounds straightforward enough, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that uh, in that many territories, many different countries have statutory law that says you can't have patent protection for certain types of innovation. Um, and so typically computer software, business methods, methods of playing games, etc., would, would fall into this list of what we call the excluded categories, where if your innovation is considered by the patent office to relate to that type of technology, then you just won't be allowed to have a patent for it, even if it is deemed to be potentially novel and inventive. So these questions really are answered on a case-by-case -case basis. Each patent office will take a look at the invention that is described and claimed in your patent application. They will compare it against what's already known in your technical field. They will try to establish whether it falls into that list of excluded types of invention. And if not, if, if it's potentially patentable material, they will then have a look to see if they think that there is that all-important novel and inventive feature in your technology. If you jump all of those hurdles, if you satisfy the examiner that your invention does something new, non-obvious and technical, then you get your certificate and you get your 20-year monopoly right. Sounds easy, right? Scott, that was a great summary from, from Carrie Ann. Um, do you have anything to add from the US perspective since you practice in the United States? Yeah, one thing I'd like to add is that um, Karen is absolutely right. You cannot patent uh, software and business methods. But there's also a big misconception out there that you cannot patent software and business methods. And I really have to explain that. Mm -hmm. And really, it's about how you couch the invention um, to the patent office, right? You know, the developers think of the invention as software or a new way of doing business. But in reality, there's technical innovation going on 
underneath the scenes and it's, it's our job to kind of identify what those are and present them in the right way to the patent office. And so we can get, um, we can get those patents for them. Um, and on the last hurdle, whether it's technical, um, in the United States we say, you know, is, is the idea an abstract idea because you cannot patent abstract ideas. And to be honest, nobody knows what that means. The courts have made a big mess of that. Um, but in reality, um, telling whether an idea is an abstract idea or not um, is a lot like telling the difference between pornography and art, right? You know it when you see it. And really it comes down to, is it a technical innovation, right? Is it something that required knowledge of technology and application of that knowledge in a new and inventive way? Well, let's dig into that in the blockchain space. So for example, I would argue an abstract idea is the general idea of a distributed ledger, right? That you would, you would probably agree is an abstract idea that could not be patented. Absolutely. Um, you know, and you know, if there was some type of new type of distributed ledger, it's possible to get patents on the specific implementations of a distributed ledger. But you're right, you're absolutely right. You cannot get a patent on just the, the grand idea of a distributed ledger. Okay, let's turn to Will. So Will, obviously you spend a lot of time monitoring and working in this space. Can you give us some types of examples uh, from what you're seeing, not just at Enchain, but across the entire industry of the types of inventions that are most commonly being uh, granted patents versus ones that are not? Yeah, thanks Jimmy. I think I would agree with what the guys are saying here. So if it feels like the innovation is a contribution in technical terms, so you're, you're somehow furthering the technology, um, then the patent offices are quite willing to grant patents there. And at, at Enchain, we've had, had some real successes. Um, so I think the, for the engineers and the scientists, if you, if you feel like you're making a contribution at the technical level, you absolutely should be speaking to, to your patent attorney. Um, a good example of a sort of counter example is that many governments, uh, as a matter of policy, so we've talked about not being abstract, uh, but some governments, for example, China, uh, also will not patent anything that is a cryptocurrency. So if your patent applications mention uh, money or digital currency, then you are automatically going to face rejections. Uh, so it's always navigating through, right, on the one hand, what contribution am I making, uh, while on the other hand, not sounding like um, what we're proposing is a, is a new currency. Carrie ann Yeah, I, I, I think what's, what's coming out from the comments from all three of us that hopefully is, is uh, coming across to the audience too is that there's a very territorial aspect to, to patent practice. Um, and so what might work in one country, what might be allowable, what might get through the grant in one country may well not be patentable and allowable in another. And also that it's really, really important if you are considering trying to get patent protection for your, for your technology, that you do so with a practitioner, a patent practitioner that is very uh, au fait, not just with patent practice, but with patent practice for your type of technology that has some understanding of the industry that you are operating in, but also has a technical background that when they um, are drafting the application or when they are putting arguments to the patent office, they have the technical understanding and ability to be able to drill down into the lower level details of exactly not just what the invention does, but, but also how it does it, because quite often that is going to be absolutely fundamental to the success or rejection of your patent application. So, um, you know, I, I guess that the bottom line is make sure that that you're working with someone, a legal provider, who understands your technology, understands your industry, and um, is obviously uh, very aware of the legal nuances and practices in, in the particular territories that you want to seek protection in. Let's dig into the types of technical areas that you're confronting when you are dealing with blockchain patent applications? Cryptography, uh, data transmission, what are, what are the things you're seeing most commonly? Absolutely. Um, I think cryptography is one of the big ones because, I mean, the foundation of Bitcoin is cryptography. That's what makes it safe. That's what makes it work. Um, now, cryptography is an obscure subject, but there's really a lot of flexibility in what you can do and cannot do to make things really secure. And so there's a lot of innovation we're seeing 
around that. You know, how do you take advantage of this immutable distributed global ledger and still keep everything secure for all the activity that is occurring outside of the ledger? You know, how do you make sure that what's going on the ledger is what's supposed to go on the ledger? Um, and you know, on top of that, we're seeing a lot of innovation in applications of blockchain, um, where kind of the, the blockchain itself, it, it's using the properties of the blockchain, the, the scalability, the immutability, the, um, the global aspect of it, the public aspect of it, in order to enable all types of new functionality that people have never seen before, be, you know, before Bitcoin existed. Um, you know, we're seeing some, uh, some not as much, and then maybe that's just my perspective, but we're seeing some hardware-based stuff um, because you can get innovation on how, you know, how the mining hardware works. You know, if you figure out how to way to, a way to, you know, increase the, the hash power a little bit or save some energy or something like that, um, there's also innovation to be had there. Yeah, so you're, so you're seeing, you know, claims to inventions for functions using on top of a blockchain, but not for blockchain itself. Well, the blockchain has been invented. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, yeah. it was in the white paper, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the Satoshi's paper mm -hmm. um, back a, uh, quite a while now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, for the most part set in stone. And so what you're seeing is applications sitting on top of that. Yeah. So Will, Enchain receives a lot of attention both within and the BSV community and in the broader digital currency world for being one of the world's largest filers of blockchain patent applications. I want to give you an opportunity to tell our audience about Enchain's IP portfolio and anything you want them to know about it. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, that's true. That's absolutely true. So, Enchain is uh, one of the earliest and one of the uh, largest holders of uh, blockchain related patent applications in the world. Um, for me, that's sort of natural when you think that Enchain is 150 plus people, right? Some of the brightest and best in the blockchain industry. Um, some, of, some of our colleagues having been in the space from the beginning. Um, so I think it's natural that because everything we're doing with these cutting edge uh, technology it's all breaking new ground, it's all innovation, right? So I think it's natural that there's going to be a lot of invention in a company like Enchain. And the things that we have done well at Enchain is from the very outset recognize that we're breaking new ground in terms of technology. Um, and from very early on, recognize the importance of properly assessing our intellectual property, right? And, Carry on, for example, has been, been involved from, from very early on in the Enchain days. So I would definitely um, echo the point that, that Scott just made that it's, it's the applications, right? So the, the, the chain itself has been invented. And in some of the presentations that we've seen um, at CoinGeek over these last couple of days, you will see discussion of how Enchain is providing that layer above the blockchain. And that's very much where our innovation sits. Um, and as I say, everything that we do is breaking new ground. So it has put us in the position where globally, um, so uh, we have an external uh, firm of patent analytics experts that prepare data for us. And according to the latest data, uh, we are number eight globally in terms of portfolio size. That's by number of inventions, so not by total number of applications. So we're definitely up there with sort of the, the powerhouse, household names of technology and finance uh, that are also in the broader blockchain space. But I don't like, Jimmy, to think too much about numbers on their own. Um, the reason being, if you look at the way the blockchain space is at the moment, uh, patent filings have been growing exponentially for the last few years. So since 2014, um, the number of new filings has been doubling every year. And now, if you look at the top 20, the top 10, you will see um, that the space is really becoming dominated by big companies, uh, kind of incumbent technology companies, who have come into the space fairly recently with huge filings, filing numbers, I mean. So you will see technology companies who have filed 1,000 patent applications in a year. So I think as you look at the space, what you're going to see is you can ask yourself the question, if a company can file 1,000 new applications in one year, are all of those uh, applications concerning you know, really high technical merit inventions, or is there going to be some uh, 
lower quality applications in there. So at Engine, we're not really looking at the numbers as such. Uh, we focus on quality rather than quantity. And we continue to make sure that we apply scientific diligence to our work and that we work with the best professionals to take the best advice to uh, protect things in line with our strategy. Well, we'll stay with you. Um, I, I hear sometimes because Enchain is so associated with the Bitcoin SV blockchain in particular, um, questions about whether or not Enchain's inventions and patent portfolio is only about Bitcoin SV. Can you help clarify whether Enchain's inventions are only usable on the Bitcoin SV network? Oh yeah, good question, Jimmy. Uh, for sure they're not. For sure they're not, um, specifically BSV. Um, so I just mentioned that we, we sort of see ourselves as this layer uh, sitting above the blockchain. Uh, so for many of the inventions, we're going to be talking about chain agnostic inventions. But I'd go a step further than that and say some of the uh, inventions would even be applied outside of the blockchain realm. Right? So we've been talking about cryptography and cryptographic techniques. Um, there's, there's also access control and some general sort of advanced IT techniques that are applicable each, even outside of the blockchain space. Um, so definitely not uh, BSV specific IP portfolio at all. No. Got it. So it's a general technology portfolio Absolutely. of inventions that is not tied to Bitcoin SV. No. no, no, no. Carrie Ann, you've been involved in the Enchain patent process since early in its life. Can you give us an example of one of the Enchain inventions you've had to work with that uh, extends well even beyond blockchain usage? Uh, yes, well, I mean, there's, there's number 42, um, as it's affectionately known, uh, which is a cryptographic technique that uh, that can be used in, in a whole variety of applications. Uh, there's, there's another patent that, uh, that we have at Enchain that's uh, for the use of that in securing a key slice for uh, controlling access to a, a, a controlled sensitive resource. Um, so again, these are, these are techniques that aren't necessarily what you would think of as purely blockchain related. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that, as, as Will was saying, uh, obviously Enchain is uh, aligned very closely with BSV and, and that community, but the patent portfolio, and to be honest, if your patent attorney is doing a good job, you know, they, they should be drafting your patent applications and claiming your, your technology at the patent office in such a way that it is is uh, defined as broadly as possible to give you the widest scope of, of legal protection for that technology, uh, rather than tying that technology to a, to a particular uh, protocol or even a particular application in, in some way. You should always start, at least start with going in uh, at the patent office as broadly as possible um, with the intention that maybe you will have to, to narrow that protection down. Uh, but there are, there are numerous applications within the Enchain portfolio that, uh, that fall into the category of wider application than even just blockchain, for sure. Scott, let's t turn to you. So there are a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, uh, ventures probably watching right now online who are working in the blockchain space. And they might be thinking, should I, should I not pursue you know, patents for any of the work product they're creating? Um, what advice do you have to companies about when to file patent applications and the types of inventions that are most likely to get patented in the blockchain space for them? Sure. In response to the question of when, um, especially for startups, I often you know, talk to them about you know, what, what their finances are like because patents are a very big investment. They're very expensive. Um, and as a result, it takes a lot of capital to create a robust patent portfolio. Um, now, if that capital being used on patents is going to prevent the business from actually operating, what's the point? You know, you can get a patent portfolio, but what are you going to do with it? That's not your goal unless your goal is to be a patent troll. Um, so in terms of timing, I say, you know, wait until you secure enough investment that you can actually get started. And there's different levels of getting started. Um, but once you have that capital, um, one of the things you want to think about is uh, what, um, you know, when is the invention ready for patenting? And some people think they actually have to build it before they patent it, and that's not the case. Um, 
really you have to have a concrete enough idea in your mind that you could draft a patent application where somebody could look at the patent application and kind of build the invention on their own. That's kind of how it works. Um, so that's the stage you want to do it. Um, now, timing of the patent application, you definitely want to do it before you launch. Um, in the United States, you kind of have this year grace period where if you launch, you have a year until you can file your patent application. But in most countries around the world, if you've already launched, then you, you're really out of luck. And so if your invention is one that has global applicability and you think you have the investment to go global, you really want to get your patent applications on file early before you launch and actually before there's any kind of uh, non-secret disclosure outside of your company. Yeah. Well, let's turn to this broader question that arises in the blockchain world about whether or not patents are even good. You know, a lot of developers in the digital currency and blockchain ecosystem believe that uh, code and work should be provided open source for free usage uh, to anyone in the development community. How would you address developers who question whether or not blockchain ventures should even try to protect their intellectual property versus making it available for free usage? Yeah, thanks Jimmy. So a general comment first, I would say that um, if you're looking for investments, then investors are going to want to know that you have some kind of ownership of your technology. Right? So if you're going to go through any kind of due diligence, if you're doing any kind of capital raise, then the intellectual property position that you have is going to be a question that they need to ask. So if you think you need serious capital in order to fund what you want to do, then I think you need to take IP uh, very seriously as a starting point for any company. Uh, and then uh, sort of on a more personal note, I find that when we're talking to companies uh, about potential partnerships, uh, or even whether they're going to be a client for Enchain, one of the things that's very nice about having an established patent portfolio is it, it makes it easier to talk. You're less worried about people stealing your ideas um, or there being confusion over who came, over, who came up with what if each of the parties already has robust processes in place, the right kind of advisors, and are timely recording their intellectual property and taking steps to protect it. So I actually think it makes it easier um, for parties to speak and collaborate when they've already taken steps to protect what they think is their own intellectual property. Karen, uh, will you take this moment to help clarify for our online audience a misconception I often see, which is that just because code or other work product is made available for open source license usage, does that mean the creator doesn't actually have intellectual property rights in it? Yeah, that's, that's a whole minefield, isn't it, open source? I think there's this misconception um, that probably flows from the use of the term open, that open source uh, necessarily means free for all, and that's not, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, there are hundreds of different open source licenses out there, but essentially the, the license means that, that you're agreeing to certain uh, conditions and obligations in order to use that, that software. Um, and you need to be really, really careful if you're going to use open source software that you understand what the obligations are in the, in the particular open source license that you're, that you're potentially going to use. Um, because sometimes people um, don't check out those obligations, they don't check out the details, and then they get a shock that actually that open source license wasn't actually as open as they thought it was, or, or even that open at all. So if you are looking at using open source, make sure you know what you're doing and the license that you are going to be going for. Um, really good advice, you know, seek professional counsel and, and make sure that you're dealing with a lawyer like you used to be, Jimmy, with your in your technology lawyer lifetime um, that understands the differences between the different licenses and how you can select the one that actually works for you. Um, so absolutely, um, they're, they're open source does not mean necessarily that there's no intellectual property rights that can be exerted through, through that open source license. So be careful, it is a minefield. So Scott, for example, if you wrote software and you put it out for usage even under the MIT open source license, a very common one, you still actually are the copyright owner to that software, correct? You're the copyright owner for that software. Um, you are also 
you know, if you have patents mm -hmm. on the underlying technology mm -hmm. in that software, you are the patent holder for that right. software. And so anyone who uses that license in order to use your software mm -hmm. is still obligated to follow the terms of the license. Correct. So you still own that IP. Right. So world out there, just because something is put out open source does not mean there are not intellectual property rights in that software or work product. It just means the owner has chosen to make it available for free usage under whatever particular license terms they provided to the world. So for example, Karian, Satoshi Nakamoto put out the first version of the Bitcoin client software uh, with a copyright notice, didn't he? Even uh, though it was under the MIT open source license. Uh, yes, so as Scott said, um, you know, you have to keep in mind that the different rights, the different IP rights are, uh, provide different forms of protection. Uh, so yeah, so copyright will literally just protect the, the written form, the representation of your, of your IP. So, um, you know, what's appearing on the screen or the, or the printed page and so on. If you change, make any sort of changes to that written form, then um, you can potentially navigate around the copyright protection. The patent protection, as we said earlier, gives you protection for the underlying fundamental concept and algorithms and the functionality. So they can, you know, that those different forms can be present um, in in the same invention and the same explanation or written description of that of that invention. So. Uh, yeah, the white paper, copyright protected. Um, but, the, but by the time I think that the uh, white paper was written, uh, the, the blockchain in, as a concept of a, of a ledger was known. Um, but Satoshi didn't choose to actually protect via patent protection the, uh, the underlying concept of putting various components together to form what became the blockchain uh, Bitcoin protocol. Right, but there are other types of rights that attach. For example, when you write a paper, your copyright ownership essentially exists at the moment. It's Absolutely. fixed in a tangible medium of expression, as we would call it. So, Will, let's go to you for another question, which is, how would you address people who say that patenting in a field like blockchain and digital currency stifles innovation versus helping the industry grow in terms of business. Yeah, I would disagree with that point, Jimmy. I mean, I think as you look across any technical field, um, innovation is really pushed forward when research is well funded. Uh, and as I said before, uh, you really can't find that funding without investors knowing that they're going to get some kind of return on investment. Right. So I, I think that you will always need uh, uh, yeah, I think there's room for both. There's room for sort of open source projects as well as commercial projects. But in order to attract those commercial projects, you're going to need to see um, proper dealing with intellectual property rights. You know, that's going to be um, private uh, research institutes, it's going to be companies, it's going to be universities. But anybody who is seriously investing in research, which I think is what we all want in order to push the technology forward, then that just comes hand in hand with patent protection for me. Carrie Ann? Um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to sort of jump in and, and concur with, with what Will has just said um, and perhaps provide an example from, from my own professional experience on this. Um, you know, I've, I, so I've been working for a few years with an entity that's uh, active in the payments industry. And as you know, payments industry, there's some very well-funded, powerful, deep-pocketed entities in, in that, uh, you know, the banks, the payment uh, providers and so on. Um, and I've worked with a company that had, a few years back, a very, very simple idea. Often the most powerful ones are, are simple in their, in their concept. Um, we took patent protection for it. That company is doing really, really well, really, really well. And the only reason that those powerful, deep-pocketed players in that industry sit at a table and talk to them and negotiate, etc., is because they have uh, patent protection. They have they have uh, something in their arsenal that they can use as leverage that that brings those parties to the table to even discuss. Otherwise, those parties would simply take the concept 
and, and go do what they wanted with it. So when you've got a, a small, innovative company like that, it does allow that, that David to go up against the Goliath. It gives them the slingshot that they can use against that, that giant. And that company can then continue to innovate. They, they can grow their portfolio by adding to their ideas, conducting more research, more innovation, and growing their technology, um, feeding back into the economy, and so on. So um, it can, there's an example of, of, of how patent protection can actually encourage and enable innovation to flourish and to grow because it, it does provide a means for keeping even potentially very, very powerful, well-funded uh, competitors off the grass while they get established and, and get their investment on board and so on. Scott, is there a one-size-fits-all answer as to whether patents are good or should companies open source their work product? Or do some companies, in your experience, because I know you've represented many uh, in the patent space, do a mix of both? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, there is no one-size-fits-all answer, that, that's for sure. Um, but you know, things like open source, patents, other types of IP, like copyright, trade secret, they all go hand in hand. And you really need a customized approach because it really depends on the technology, the business goals, and all of that. You know, for example, if your innovation is in a platform that you want people to use, mm -hmm. you're going to want to go towards, more towards open source to encourage them to use the stuff that you are producing. Um, then again, if your innovation is something that's completely secret um, and nobody's really going to be able to reverse engineer, maybe you stay away from patents. Um, but if it's going to be something that somebody could you know, put enough resources into and reproduce, then you're going to want to you know, consider patents and then look at the bigger picture to see how the other forms of IP fit in. Yeah. So for example, Microsoft has obviously a large IP portfolio, but I know they provide some of their software for free usage as long as it's on the Windows operating system, for example, even though that rights associated with that may have all kinds of patents and other copyrighted interests embedded. Oh, absolutely. When you're using Office software, there are probably thousands of patents covering that software. Yeah. Um, Will, I'll leave it to you to give us a last thought about uh, where you think the industry is going in terms of trends for patent and intellectual property protection with respect to blockchain technology. You know, where do you think this is going to uh, be in three to five years in terms of companies' patent portfolios and how they're used? Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Um, I think what we're going to see over the next few years is gaining some clarity, right? So I've talked about how there's been this exponential growth in patent filings. Uh, the, the sort of the major patent holders are sort of switching quite regularly. Uh, it's not clear which, at the moment, which patents are the valuable ones, which ones are the key patents. Uh, and in order to have really uh, a marketplace where companies know what they can or can't do, who they need to speak to for licenses, we need that clarity. So what I predict um, over the coming years is that the major patent holders are going to have to start speaking to each other um, and they're going to have to start offering clarity in the market. So I think that's what we're going to see. Okay, great. On that note, we will wrap up this session. And I want to thank all of our panelists, Scott, carrie and Will, for joining me on one of my favorite topics, intellectual property in this exciting technology space. The biggest sickness in healthcare isn't a disease. It's not a bacteria or a virus. It's the silence. See, the data we need to combat diseases, to stop suffering, it's not waiting to be uncovered. It's stuck behind closed doors in stubborn silos. The healthcare industry has the data to improve our lives in untold ways, but no one communicates. And in that silence, countless lives are lost. That's why at EHR Data, we're building the largest ever shared data set of human health. And it won't belong to a hospital, a government, a corporation. It will belong to the rightful owner of your healthcare data, you. We're merging healthcare records with blockchain to finally put you in control. Because your data doesn't belong on private servers, it should be in your hands in service to your health. The greatest sickness may be silence, but the silence stops when you have a voice. EHR Data. Own your health.